This is the GMBN Tech Essentials series, our easy to follow guide to maintaining and setting things up on your bike. This particular video is all about setting up the sag on your rear suspension and dialing everything in. Something which is actually very simple to do, provided you follow a few simple rules and you know a little bit about the equipment on your bike. Here's how you do it. Now firstly, let's talk a little bit about the equipment on your bike. So you can have some kind of shock absorber on your bike. Now the common options out there tend to be made by Fox and RockShox, but there are many different brands available in the market. And fundamentally, the Airshocks all work in the same way and they all have very similar features. So there are two main types of shock as well. There's a coil sprung shock and an air sprung shock. The main difference is on a coil sprung shock, you simply have a wound coil spring on the outside, which supports your body weight. The internals of the shock, they're all there to deal with the damping and the ride characteristics of that shock. Now with a coil sprung shock, you're limited in when you set them up to the actual spring that's on there. So you have to have the correct spring to correlate to your body weight. Now let's take a look at a few details on an actual air shock here. So I've got a RockShox Super Deluxe in my hand. But like I said, the basics are the same on most air shocks. So you're gonna have an air valve. This is a Schrader valve or car type valve. This is simply where you inflate the air into the shock to get it sprung to your body weight. Nice and simple. Then on the actual shaft part of the shock, you'll find that most shocks will have an O-ring on there, a little rubber O-ring. You can use this to monitor how much sag you have. Now the sag, crucially, is the main adjustment you need to set on any air shock. Sag, simply put, is how much the shock moves and compresses when you are sat on the bike. The effect of that is it allows the shock to extend and the wheel to fill the holes in the ground as well as compress and absorb bigger impacts. So it's a very important setup point to have. Now you might notice this shock also has a secondary chamber on here. This is called the piggyback. Now you don't have this on all shocks and don't worry if you don't on yours. This is just for additional damping support. So you tend to have this on more advanced shocks. But if we just pretend that's not there and we're talking Simply put, you have the main air can and you have the sliding tube that you measure your sag against. Nice and simple. There's also the eyelets at both ends of the shock. This is where it's mounted onto the frame. And quite often you will hear a shock referred to in eye to eye length. The shock stroke length is the length of travel it has on the exposed shaft right here. Very simple. Now all rear shocks will have some kind of rebound adjustment. That is controlling the rate at which the shock extends after an impact. Now this is another crucial thing to set up. Now you might also find on your shock, there might also be a lever or an additional dial. Now this is for adjusting the compression. Now most riders will be familiar with this for the term lockout. Simply put, if you turn this lever all the way to this point, in fact, there's a little icon there to suggest the padlock is locked. That effectively locks out the shock. So it means it's not going to operate under your body weight, which means it can be very efficient for riding up hills or road sections, anywhere where you don't want the shock to be operating. And then when you hit the off-road section or your descending sections, you can open it up and the shock opens up and feels very nice. But essentially, the common rule is compression tends to be blue and rebound tends to be red. Now, the information we're about to give you is very general and applies to all shocks on the market. But if you want to be a bit more specific to your actual shock, it's worth checking your manufacturer's website. Now, when you do this, they're going to recommend base settings. So there's going to be air pressure settings in order to set the shock to your approximate body weight. And they'll do that in percentages of the travel available, which we'll get to in a minute. The other one they're going to refer to is how many clicks or turns of rebound and compression you might want to have to get started on your bike. Some manufacturers will refer to their compression and rebound settings from fully open and some will refer to it from fully closed. So what exactly do you need to do in order to set your sag? Well first up, if you have an air shock, you're going to need a shock pump. You cannot do this without that. If you don't have an air shock and you have a coil spring on your bike, you might want to have a tape measure and I'll show you why when we get to it. Of course, you're going to need a shock, of course, on your bike. If you've got a hardtail, there's no point even doing this. Now, something that's very important to note with any type of rear shock absorber is the fact your body weight is affected by what you carry when you ride. So therefore, it's recommended when you set your sag up to do this, wearing all the kit you're likely to wear when you go for a ride. That means a hydration pack if you carry one, fill up with water with the amount of water you're likely to 
carry with you, phones, tools, helmet, all of that sort of stuff, because it does make a big difference to how your bike will feel on the trail. Right, so the first thing you need to do just before you get going with setting up your sag on the bike is understand sag and also make sure your shock is prepared. So if you have a lockout on there, make sure it is fully open before you do this. If you have any sort of climb switch on your shock, make sure that is fully open. And if you have any compression dials, make sure they're unwound. As I explained at the beginning of the video, the reason you set up sag on there is to now enable the shock to let the wheel track the ground properly. Now, if you have too much sag, it's gonna feel wallowy. If you don't have enough, it's gonna feel harsh. Now, the typical amounts vary between 20 and 30% sag. This is what manufacturers recommend, but it does vary on your preferences. If you have a long travel bike, I would probably err on slightly less sag to start with. And likewise, if you have a short travel bike, I'd err on slightly more just to start with. But this is personal preference. So for example, RockShox with a debonair air sleeve on there, they recommend 30% sag. Whereas with the Solo Air, they recommend 20% sag. These are all specifics to your shock, but the general rule of thumb, 20 to 30% sag, or the way you like it. Now the typical rule of thumb is putting your body weight in as air pressure. So I'm 200 pounds, and I'm gonna start by putting 200 pounds of air into this Fox shock that's on my bike. Now the same applies to rock shocks. 200 pounds in body weight equates to your base setting of 200 pounds in air. Now this will vary depending on the suspension design of your bike. So you start at this point, you might need to release some air, you might need to add some more air. It's that simple. But something you need to know about different shocks is about the equalization process. Now with rock shocks, you need to be pumping the shock up to 100 psi first, then you need to compress the shock five times to about 50% of the travel. That enables some of the air to go from the main chamber into the negative chamber. The reason for this is so the positive and negative air chambers inside the shock can equalize. Then you can continue to inflate from there. But with a Fox shock, like this one on my bike here, I'm gonna inflate it to my body weight and then with the shock still in place, compress it about 10 times to about 25% of the travel and then this will equalize those positive and negative air chambers. That's the general rule of thumb between the two systems. Now at this point, this is when it's handy to have a friend if you haven't got a surface you can balance up next to because they can hold the handlebars of your bike to keep you upright. I'm balancing just on the bench here, I'm sat on the bike. Now what you need to do in order to set this sag, and I'm looking for 30% in this case, is to bounce up and down a few times on the seat. This will just break the stiction in the seal of the shock there, and then set that O-ring. So put the O-ring up against the wiper seal, just like this, and then very carefully, try not to disturb it, take your body weight off the bike, so get off the bike, and then that will be the sag that you've just set. Now what you're looking for is 30%, in this case, of the available shaft travel. Now some shocks, like this RockShox one on screen right now, will have indicators on the shaft itself. Other shocks, like the one I'm using on my bike, don't have that. Now in this particular case, for about 30% sag, I'm looking at 16.5 millimeters of sag here. So that is the distance between the seal itself and the O-ring. So I'm just about on that now. Uh, and actually I'm happy with that. Now on your setup, if you're running slightly firm or slightly softer than this, simply repeat with the air shock until you get there. Now when you're measuring a coil shock, it's a little bit different because you don't quite have access to the, the shaft on the shock in the same way that you do with the exposed shaft on an air shock. So ideally, the easiest way to do this is measure the distance between the two eyelets of the shock there to get the total length. And then basically you can work out a percentage of sag in relation to the amount of travel that that shock has. In a similar way that you worked out the sag on this Fox Air Shock that I've just done, you do the same, but instead of measuring it by looking at the O-ring on the actual shock itself, you have to simply measure the eye to eye distance as you sit on the bike, and hopefully you're gonna be within that 30% area. If you're not, this is where things can get tricky. On coil shocks, you only have two turns of the preload ring to adjust and compensate for that in either direction. Any more than that, and you're gonna to need to change the spring rate for either a heavier spring or a lighter spring. Coil springs come in varying different weights. They all come between 50 pound increments 
but when it's a fine measurement, you're gonna to need to go 25 pound increment. You'd only really get these between 400 pounds and 500 pound springs. So it can be quite tricky to get the shock just right. If you aren't able to measure between the two eyelets on a shock because of the strange frame design, for example, it's not the easiest on Blake's particular bike here. Another way to do this is to do it by wheel travel. So Blake's bike is a Scott Gambler. It has 210 millimeters of rear wheel travel. Now, if you measure the distance between the back of the saddle and the wheel, when you sit on the bike, the amount of sag to get 30% on this bike is 67 millimeters. So if you deduct the 67 millimeters from that distance between the tire and the saddle, you can work out that that's the 30% sag. Again, it does depend on the settings on the bike. Blake does like his bikes to feel quite firm. Other people might want them to run about 40% sag on a bike with this much travel. Now, once you have the sag set up on your bike in the area that you're looking for, the next thing to adjust is the rebound. So again, that is the rate at which the shock extends to its full length. So what you're looking for is a happy medium between something that's fast enough to react to bumps on the trail, but slow enough to keep everything under control. If it's too fast, it will feel like a pogo stick and out of control. If it feels too slow, it's gonna feel really harsh and over damped. Now, most manufacturers offer a handy chart with base settings to start from, just like the air ratings according to body weight. So it's just a few examples floating by on screen now, just so you can get this. And a really helpful guide to start with. Now on the shock I have on my Newt proof here, it's a little bit more advanced. You have to use an Allen key to adjust it. And there's actually two settings, but there are base settings on the website for it. For this RockShox one, it's really simplified. Tortoise in the hair, very, very simple to set up. Experiment with this and see what feels best for you. And the compression adjustment on the shock, really that's more of a convenience on most shock absorbers. The reason you would have this is simply to make the bike climb a little bit nicer. It's nothing to do with the, the setup on your bike as far as the suspension design goes. It's more when you're climbing, your body weight is moving around. And by using that lockout, you, you stabilize the bike so it climbs a lot more efficiently. So have a little play with that out on the trail. Just make sure when you hit all the fun stuff, that you unlock it to maximize on all that nice shock absorbing travel you have. So there we go, it's that simple. Just take your time and you'll get it right. If you're unsure, get a friend to help you. It can make it a little bit easier to do this process. For a couple more videos, click down here for our Essentials playlist. So that's all of the other videos in this series. And if you wanna find out how to set up your suspension fork in exactly the same way as what we've just walked you through, click up top there. As always, please continue to give us thumbs up for all our videos on GMBN Tech. And if you haven't already done so, click that subscribe button.